Hi, my name is James Hunter, and this is a My Two Cents channel where I talk about topics from uh, physical fitness, mental health, wellness, and just topics I may want to discuss. And today I'm going to talk about training to failure. My last video, I talked about you know what the, the idea is about pre-exhaustion type techniques for resistance training, uh, for hypertrophy, for basically you know I'm going to get bigger muscle, uh, bigger muscles, if you will, or as a lot of people like to say, their gains, right? And that's not necessarily just muscle size, but, you know, gains can also be strength, right? Bigger muscles uh, will help with getting stronger, okay? All right. So training to failure uh, is what I want to talk about today. Now, I started lifting weights uh, when I was 12, going on 13. Um, as I, I mentioned my age in all my videos, uh, not just because I want to sound like a broken record, but for those people who maybe haven't seen my other videos, they may not know. I'm 48 years old, uh, 48 and a half. And I make mention of my age just to kind of give a, a, a point of reference to kind of uh, why I think the way I do. And also about my own progression in my life, where I've come from with, with my own training. So I started lifting weights, 12 going on 13, in the seventh grade. Uh, I played football all the way through my senior year in high school, ran track and field. So yeah, I, I did weight training every year, and I still to this day uh, lift weights and maintain some type of a program. So we would push ourselves. Uh, we were already uh, training to pretty much training to failure in terms of until we could not get another rep <clears throat> that if we could not complete the concentric part uh, of the repetition or the positive, you know, positive and negative. If you think of it that way, the positive where you're like a bench press, for example, trying to press and lock it out. So when the upward motion would stop and the, the bar starts going down, you know, you're already uh, getting to a point of failure. Now, people can debate over what constitutes, uh, you know, co a complete failure versus uh, what is that threshold. I want to get too much into that. But basically, when you uh, cannot continue another rep, you know, you can kind of uh, look at other uh, literature on what they consider, uh, what the threshold is for that failure on a repetition. But Nevertheless, once you can no longer complete a rep on your own, yeah, we would uh, help each other, you know, complete some assisted reps and then would rack the weight. So this was something that was already going on. <clears throat> now, when I'm training uh, in the gym, if I'm by myself, I, I may not be able to tra uh, train completely to what uh, that upper threshold of a failure could be in terms of if I have a spotter there and maybe I get a few more reps because I know someone's there so I don't get hurt. Uh, so... With training to failure, I looked at different types of uh, research and literature reviews and what is said about it. I mean, what is the advantage? Is there a benefit to training to failure? Can it help you with uh, muscle hypertrophy? Is there a um, borderline area or a threshold in there to what constitutes you're getting benefit versus maybe you're overtraining? So I uh, have a subscription to uh, or a membership, if, uh, rather, to the National Strength and Conditioning Association. Uh, I'm also a certified personal trainer through them uh, for more than uh, for quite a while now, more than 10 years, 11 or more. And I have a, you know, with the membership, you get the uh, Journal of Research to the NSCA. It's, it's a blue, thicker uh, type of a journal you get. But they also send you, uh, it's, it's smaller, the uh, Journal of Condi uh, Strength and Conditioning Journal. It has studies in it as well. So... <clears throat> I go through what's current, and I, you know, I'll go back to as far as I've been a member and look at a lot of the literature. So I found an article on training to failure. Uh, it's, it's about as far as uh, resistance uh, exercise programs are. I'm not going to read this entire study to you, but I am going to kind of uh, share some of the uh, information in terms of, uh, first of all, uh, what is considered uh, training to failure, and I want to talk about <clears throat> the part or the as far as um, the hypertrophy, as far as for, for mus muscle growth in terms of how that benefit works, okay? So I wanted to share this with the people on my channel. So a lot of times people get accused of bro science, you know, it's just their opinion, you know, stuff that they maybe, uh, you know, anecdotal or just they heard it at the gym. So I'm actually going to, you know, share something with you that's actually uh, legit, done by people smarter than us, right? You know, the people who do this for a living. So in terms of the research aspect of it. So let's talk about uh, kind of like an overview. So what is training to failure as far as uh, that concept? It's basically intentionally reaching failure during resistance exercise sets is a common practice that might be most beneficial for stimulating hypertrophy. However, failure training performed too frequently can result in reductions in the resting concentration of testosterone 
and may contribute to the overtraining syndrome. So that can be a critique of, tra of this training to failure concept. Now, with myself, my other video, I talked about for you know the pre-exhaustion, there are certain techniques as far as periodization, if I wanna you know, systematically start varying my, my program to try to either uh, elicit more results or to uh, you know maintain or so I don't go backwards. I want to uh, you know make sure that I kind of cycle through these different type of interventions I may use. I may do it for six weeks and then change it up again. So if I'm going to do a training to failure type of a you know approach and see how this works for, for me, uh, you know I may do it for a period of uh, six weeks. So <clears throat> the research suggests that the greatest effectiveness when failure training is practiced consistently over a six week cycle. Uh, interspersed with uh, exclusive non-failure training cycles over equal periods. So people like coaches or personal trainers, they may consider that their athletes, uh, the training status and goals and the point in, in a yearly training cycle to determine whether sets are to be performed uh, to failure or ended sh uh, short of reach and failure. So kind of like depends on what time of the year it is um, and as far as like people who play sports. I know during the football season, uh, during we had football games and so on, we're not going to train this intense. You know, we just do uh, an intermediate weight training uh, workout because one, we don't want to get hurt, and two, you, you don't want to be too sore uh, on the day of the football game. However, in the off season, you know, you're not playing football. Uh, yeah, you can do this type of stuff because you don't have to worry about playing on Friday. So now, if you're someone who's not an athlete, then you know you don't have to worry about you know going to a football game. But what if you you know, do other things, uh, other type of sports and so on. Like I, I do uh, bodybuilding, powerlifting still. Uh, I like to run, you know, mar uh, 5Ks and things like that and then do uh, relay teams for marathons and so on. So it just depends on what's appropriate for you and what meets your goals. But you can definitely do this for six weeks uh, at a time during certain times of the year that you feel is appropriate for you. So let's um, go ahead. Let me kind of uh, share a little bit more information on here. So, all right. So with uh, training to failure, as I mentioned before, uh, people have their opinions on what meets that threshold for failure. But typically failure typically occurs initially during the concentric phase of a repetition when the muscles cannot produce sufficient torque to lift a given load beyond a critical joint angle or sticking point or sticking region. At this time, as I mentioned, the spotter may provide the lifter with sufficient assistance to progress through a sticking point or region so that the repetition can be completed. So, as I mentioned, um, you know, I've talked to different people and I see people working out in the gym. I've had different training partners and people have different, op uh, different opinions about this. Myself, I want to the, you know, I ask myself the question, as especially now that I'm getting older, um, does the benefit outweigh the risk? If, you know, what is that ratio? And that's a decision you got to make. So for me, if I'm going to train to failure, I make that judgment call to what I, what's going to constitute failure for me. And in the definition I just gave, that works for me. I can do that, maybe get one or two extra reps and then, you know, rack it or put the dumbbells down, keep my rest period short between the sets that's going to you know make a big difference too as far as the intensity i've seen some people uh, go to ridiculous failure to where they're not even uh, able to control the the weight uh, on the negative uh, part of it or the eccentric and that can be dangerous especially if, if you don't have a good spotter you're uh, by yourself um, so you don't want to get injured doing this so you know use use good common sense and judgment so what are the benefits let's let's talk about that i'm going to skip right to the, the part relative to this video we're talking about muscle growth so uh hypertrophy uh i'm going to kind of read through this uh, academic type stuff and then i'll kind of just kind of you know I'm not going to read the whole thing but i want to get into uh, what is i guess the science if you will say about this approach why does this work so numerous mechanisms such as uh hypoxic factors and free radicals they have been implicated in promoting exercise-induced hypertrophy. So, however, within the context of failure versus non-failure training approaches, one mechanism that has been specifically compared is the acute secretion of growth hormone. This hormonal response is positively correlated with greater levels of blood lactate 
indicative of the emphasis uh, on anaerobic glycolysis for adenosine triphos triphosphate, which, or ATP production. So essentially, uh, adenosine triphosphate, basically like the universal molecule uh, or currency for, for energy, you know, you won't be able to flex your, move your muscles at anaerobic type of output. And, and maybe in another video, you can talk about some of the, uh, you know, creatine monohydrate and the uh, creatine phosphagen system and some of these other things that are, are supposed to help uh, replenish ATP at a greater rate or uh, increase your lactic acid threshold, if you will, is maybe a better way of saying that, <clears throat> so you can get a better workout or, or get more reps in. So I want to get off topic on that, but it does mention this uh, as one of the benefits. So these physiological responses are especially pronounced when moderate repetition sets, such as the 8 to 12 rep uh, range, are performed in, con in conjunction or shorter rest intervals between sets, as mentioned, 30 seconds to two minutes. For me, I'm like more of like a 30 second guy if I'm doing like, let's say I'm doing dumbbell flies, uh, or heck, I might be, I might be supersetting a set of dumbbell flies with, with uh, dips, and then I might rest 30 seconds and then go do another set again. Uh, if I'm doing the 10 sets of 10 reps with squats, then yeah, I'm, I'll probably take the full 60 seconds. I'm not going to rest a full two minutes to me that's just way too much rest and doesn't produce enough intensity in my opinion so performing sets to failure with a moderate intensity load 8 to 12 rep range uh, induces different physiological responses versus performance sets to failure with a higher intensity load such as the 4 to 6 rep range so the uh, 8 to 12 rep range induces uh, different physiological responses versus performance sets to failure with a higher intensity load of the four to six, six rep range. I want to repeat that so you hear that. So when considering performance of multiple sets, anaerobic glycolysis is a primary avenue for ATP production with the moderate intensity load and the ATP phosphagen creatine system is the primary avenue for ATP production with the higher intensity load the greater repetitions per set and the metabolic stress associated with moderate intensity sets performed to failure might be the key factors that stimulate greater acute secretion of growth hormone. There again, they're mentioning the growth hormone again, and thus it's going to contribute to hypertrophy. So I'm going to stop right there. There's a lot that you can find, uh, a lot of good information. And this is the volume 32, number three of Strength and Conditioning Journal. This one's actually from 2010. I got these... Uh, going on 11 years back from this year to 2019. And there's even just current information on this. So what this is gonna help, um, simply to summarize it, it's gonna help us you know, release more human growth hormone or secrete more human growth hormone. Mentions ATP in there as well. Now, there is that threshold I mentioned in the beginning, you know, where's the fine line between getting a benefit versus the overtraining syndrome. Uh, definitely, you know, something you may have to tweak for yourself. Human beings are so variable. Uh, how old you are, uh, what your hormone balance is for your age already. If you're an older guy, you know, maybe different for somebody who's younger, who's more resilient and recovers faster. So supplements you can take that can help with, uh, you know, your training, you know, creatine monohydrate, for example. There's a lot of things that you could uh, look at if you're going to be doing this type of training. So I would encourage you to do your own uh, research uh, the bioenergetic system, uh, you know, you got the creatine phosphagen system, uh, uh, glycolysis, uh, anaerobic, uh, oxidative system, aerobic, if you will, uh, how, we, uh, how we break down energy substrates, you know, fats, carbs, and protein. Anaerobic, you know, you don't need the oxygen involved to metabolize or break down glycogen, right? That's anaerobic. Aerobic, you know, fat requires oxygen. To be metabolized and broken down so these types of things uh, not to get too far off topic you know you know i'll do a video later on on the bioenergetic system uh, human metabolism i actually have a video uh, it's it's uh, i think it's my trailer video on metabolism i talk about that a bit so i hope this uh, information uh, is useful to you kind of gives you like oh you know that's why uh, what's one of the benefits for training to failure you know, and I'll just be honest where I get information from. I don't, you know, NSCA to me, yeah, I, I, I'm a big believer in what, what they do and being certified through them <clears throat> as a trainer. 
and uh, being a member, I find it, find them as a very valuable resource. But there's other uh, resources that are out there that you can do your research to find studies that are published. So, you know, do do your part. You know, just like I read things and I learn and become educated, so can you. You know, you're not uh, helpless. Your people out there have the tools to go out and become educated and gain knowledge. Um, knowledge, they say, is power, but I disagree. It's the application of knowledge uh, that can empower you and so on, and to help you make informed choices. So I'm going to be really uh, doing some things different uh, next year, January, just around the corner. My last uh, few videos have been talking about that. It's not that I haven't worked out hard. <clears throat> excuse me. I haven't worked out hard in the past. And this year when I trained for my bodybuilding contest, you know, I did train hard, you know, I'd get sore, you know, I trained a heavy, I was doing freaking uh, dumbbell rows with 150 pound dumbbells. Uh, and, you know, when you're my weight, uh, you know, 160 pounds, and actually, during my prep, I was a bit lighter than lighter than that. Uh, those that's pretty heavy dumbbell rows there, you know, so I wasn't being a slouch. Uh, but there's things I can do better, in my opinion, to mix it up that periodization, if you will, and do some things different for a period of six weeks. Uh, yeah, I'm going to make it a point to shorten my rest periods. I'm going to be uh, incorporating more volume, as I mentioned in my uh, other two previous videos. Um, uh, 10 sets of 10 reps, 60 seconds rest on my barbell squats. I'm going to kind of I'm going to apply that to some of the more compound movements for upper body too, multi-joint, like the bench press, for example, or dumbbell press. And uh, I'm going to be trying some of this uh, pre-exhaustion, you know, with the single pre-exhaust in the single joint or synergistic uh, muscle. Uh, before I do the, the uh, multi-joint exercise and sequence and so on. So I'm going to be trying this. I want to uh, objectively find out, you know, yeah, how much uh, better can I improve from last year? I believe I can. Uh, I'm going to take some baseline measurements on my, on my guns, and I'm not going to tell you all how big they are in this video. I'll do a separate video, but maybe you can guess in the comments how big you think my biceps are for a 160 pound guy. Um, so I'm gonna, and I'm, these are cold, cold flexing right now, I'm not pumped up. As a lot of y'all know, your arms are bigger pumped up. So I'm gonna take some baseline measurements. I'm gonna get my chest, get my chest uh, all, all the way around, arms, uh, quads, legs, the whole nine yards. Heck, I'll probably even measure my calves. And then I'm gonna, you know, track my progress. You know, I, I'm not gonna compete until probably, uh, uh, June, July, for sure, July 4th, uh, here in Corpus Christi, the MPC Battle on the Bay. Uh, I've done that show um, four, five times already. So anyways, I'm going to do it again next year because it's in my backyard uh, where I live. And I may do one in Austin in June as well. So we'll, we'll see what's up with that. So I'm going to be, um, you know, doing progress videos like I did earlier this year, showing uh, how ripped I get, my uh, muscularity, how I'm improving do some uh, flexing videos or posing videos. And then of course, I'll do a video on my results and how I do. What's gonna be different next year is I'm gonna talk about my training and what I'm doing different from last time. And I'm gonna look at more uh, at the quantifiable things like uh, you know my measurements, you know, am I gaining muscle? You know, hopefully I don't think I'm gonna lose muscle. I think I'm gonna be gaining some muscle. I'm doing a lean bulk, uh, like a lot of people like to use that expression, whether you believe that's a thing that exists or not. And that's what I'm going to describe it as because I'm actually um, lighter uh, this year at this than I was uh, la at this time last year, which is good. I got a head start going into my uh, training and prep. So, what are your thoughts on training to failure? You know, have is this something you've done before? Uh, do you have maybe something you want to say? I didn't say in this video. It's already going on uh, almost 20 minutes, so I'm going to kind of wrap it up. So, if you found this useful. Uh, Please like the video. Uh, if you haven't, uh, please subscribe to my channel. I do appreciate the, the support. And I'll be making some, some videos uh, on my channel, as I mentioned, uh, not just physical fitness. Uh, I'll be doing stuff on uh, uh, mental health, wellness, and sometimes just topics that may come up that I feel like discussing. To make another video, uh, you have a, a good week. Uh, weekend's approaching. I'm going to go see a play tomorrow, uh, Christmas Carol, The Scrooge at the Harbor Playhouse. Y'all take care and have a great weekend. Thank you.